Good morning. I'm Michelle Davis of the Center for Manufacturing Research at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. Welcome to the Fall 2018 Golden Eagle Additively Innovative Virtual Lecture Series. This is the sixth semester we've produced this popular and informative series. This is by TTU Center for Manufacturing Research and the iMaker Space at TTU. The CMR is recognized as an accomplished center of excellence that draws together resources of the state of Tennessee, the university, industries, and government funding agencies into a cooperative effort to be on the leading edge of the latest technological advances in the manufacturing field. The iMaker space located in the Volpe Library on Tennessee Tech's campus has a goal of providing an interactive and collaborative space for students and faculty to use in pursuit of innovative and entrepreneurial projects. Additive manufacturing is a focus of both entities, and as such, this short virtual lecture series has been planned to highlight the best practices, potential problems, technological advances, innovations, and scientific contributions in the additive manufacturing field with expert talks from various institutions, industries, R&D centers, and laboratories. Today, we are honored to hear from Brett Connor, Professor and Director of the Advanced Manufacturing Research Center at Youngstown State University in Ohio. His talk is titled, Where's My Spare Part? Changing Maintenance, Repair, and Overhaul Through Additive Manufacturing. We request that you mute your microphones and phones during this presentation for the most optimal experience, and the speaker will provide his contact information for questions after the presentation is over. Thank you, and now I turn the presentation over to Brett. Great, thank you, Michelle, and I appreciate this invitation. Hope everyone's hearing me okay. Um, we're here at uh, Youngstown State University in Youngstown, Ohio. I've got a uh, group of students here in our additive manufacturing course, and they're joining us for this lecture. So let me go ahead and share my uh, screen here. I wanna give you a little bit of background about why issue, because some of you may not be familiar with it. Um, we, uh, we operate, uh, we're, in, we're kind of in a, a sweet spot, if you will, for additive manufacturing here. Um, we have America Makes, just a few blocks away from the university. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a vibrant uh, business incubator working in additive manufacturing. And uh, we have a Northeast Ohio additive manufacturing cluster. We're just about an hour or so away from Pittsburgh and Cleveland, places like the uh, GE Additive uh, Center in Pittsburgh, as well as uh, the uh, you know, Arconic and their facilities, ATI, LPW, et cetera, very close to where we're at, NASA Glenn Research Center as well. We do in our facility operate all seven of the uh, ASTM ISO categories of additive manufacturing equipment as well. So, um, let me continue. I want to talk about, switch over to our point here, which is about spare parts. And let me use an example of something that happens quite a bit here in Ohio and that's the need to mow our lawns. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the time of year, even now we're still in the weather that we have to stay on top of our lawns. And if it's a sunny day, that's the day you want to get out there, especially if you know that the next day it's going to be raining. So well, I want to start my lawnmower, but it won't start. And that's because the self-propelled part of the lawnmower has a gear in it that's stripped. And not only will it not, not propel, but it actually binds, the, binds up the uh, mower and I can't go anywhere. Now, this is a problem because my lawn needs to get mowed. So I'm going to head over to the store. I'm going to go over to Sears, which is where I bought the lawnmower, except they've got a problem. And that is that Sears is no longer in business here. So I can't go get my spare part there. I'm going to go over to the mower repair place, and they're like, okay, yes, I've seen this mower before. I recognize this part, but unfortunately, I don't have any of those parts in stock. All right, now I'm going to pivot to the internet, and uh, I can go, if I have the part number, I can go ahead and try to acquire that part. And I can find it there on the internet, but it's going to take me five days to get it. And, of course, now I've got the problem that my grass has now completely overtaken my yard, and... Uh, um, I've got a problem. And this is, this is the spare parts problem in a nutshell. And uh, while maybe the shape of my lawn, all right, to you may not be important to me, it's very important, but, um, but there are other industries and other places where this becomes exceptionally critical. And so I wanted to walk through this little parable to help you understand what's going on. And you have to be aware that where we're at in terms of that entire chain of 
spare part production, how we handle that supply chain is based upon the, uh, basically the results of the first and second industrial revolutions. We have a factory that's where all the manufacturing centralized there. You have to have a, uh, uh, you have to have expensive equipment associated with the, uh, with that facility to be able to do the production, your production centers, high capital assets, there's tooling and there's a high cost and long lead time associated with tooling. Of course, customization is practically limited under that. And I think one of the important things to consider here when it comes to spare parts is carrying cost and warehousing. We produce the spare parts and we send them out uh, to a warehouse to be inventory. Um, complex designs tend to be um, something that we move away from, uh, from a manufacturing standpoint. So we're not necessarily doing the most functional designs. Complexity tends to be more expensive. And so at the end of the day, what's very important from a spare parts standpoint is that low quality production or production where we're not exactly sure how many spare parts we're gonna need at any given time is gonna be challenging. Okay. And so manufacturing historically has been trapped inside of a box and so arguably is our spare parts supply chain. We generally minimize customization. Uh, we tend to minimize complexity and so complex parts become more of a challenge. And then we don't really have a freedom of quantity. We either set up for mass production or when we need onesies or twosies or 10 parts, which is normally what happens in spare parts type situations, we're not really set up for that and it tends to be very costly. I could argue that there's another axis we need to think about and that's an axis of time. When do you need to get that spare part? If it's time critical, how long does it take? Can you do it on demand? Can you make production at the point of need? All right, so let me give you several aerospace examples, uh, some of which are very hot off the press. So, uh, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about here are aerospace and defense related applications today. So a Boeing 747 has about 6 million spare parts, uh, individual components, excuse me, and a supply chain that stretches across 30 countries. Now, if I take the Department of Defense, the Defense Logistics Agency has to track $90 billion in spare parts inventory, and that's not aircraft alone, that's everything, ships, vehicles, so forth, 98 billion. And let's say if you're FedEx and you've got your entire fleet of vehicles and aircraft, it may be less than this, but it is still a daunting task to keep on top of your spare parts. Uh, one example of lead time, Oklahoma City Air Logistics Complex found a, a particular type of casting that had a 1,000 day lead time. Okay. And let's take problems in the Marine Corps. In 2016, nearly 60% of the aircraft in the Marine Corps were grounded. 29% uh, of all F-18 aircrafts were suspended waiting for spare parts, uh, and that caused operational issues as well as training issues. Right? And very hot off the press, um, the Secretary of Defense came to the Air Force, Navy, and the Marine Corps and said, raise your mission capable rates to 80% across the board. Um, if you're a student and you're doing with, uh, and you had a mission capable rate on your car of 50%, you and your professor might not be on good terms. Um, now, if you have two cars, you can bum off your parents' car, that might help. And that's kind of what's been happening in the military. But how are you realistically going to increase the rates from 49% to 80% and at the same time reduce maintenance cost? Well, we might have to look into alternative methods of manufacturing. All right. And I'll talk about the mammals program later, but um, the Air Force has challenges. You have an air, average age of your fleet being 27 years. The B-52 aircraft is up to 63 years, and the intent is to give them flying operationally to 100 years. All right, and it goes back to the same issues we had in my lawnmower example. Production location is gone. There are no spare parts that are available. The tooling's gone. You now have spares that you never even thought you would need to have spares. Parts that were never considered for spare parts are now having to be spared. Tooling and fixtures are gone. How are you going to keep this? How are you going to keep these platforms flying? So what I want to address here is talking about the value of additive manufacturing for maintenance, repair, and overhaul, or MRO. And the four key ways that additive manufacturing can support maintenance and sustainment are maintenance aids, tooling, repair, and direct part production. By maintenance aids, lower left-hand corner there is a drill guide and a trim guide um, for trimming composites. That's, that's an example of maintenance aids. Check gauges, uh, fixturing to help do a repair, prototyping, those sorts of things. Tooling, upper right-hand corner is an aerospace tool, a large additively manufactured aerospace tool for composite layups. 
Repair, that's the video there, directed energy deposition repair, that's actually from a mammals project where we're restoring worn threads using uh, directed energy deposition, and then direct part production uh, shown in the lower right-hand corner. And, and everybody focuses on direct part production for obvious reasons, but we cannot ignore the other benefits from maintenance aids, tooling, and repair. Value of replacement parts, so looking at some previous publication that we did on generally making sense of 3D printing, really the attributes that are most relevant for replacement parts, low quantity and uncertain demand, is actually a great thing for additive manufacturing. High degree of complexity, geometric complexity, assembly complexity. If you can adjust designs from uh, of legacy parts, then you can leverage additive manufacturing. Uh, and then high degree of customization. Generally with spare parts at the moment, we don't have a customization issue. But because of additive manufacturing and the potential to make things that are, say, wearable, conforming to human anatomy, then we do need to start thinking about how are we gonna handle spare parts that are customized? Of course, other values from additive manufacturing, on-demand printing, print, in our case in aerospace, right at the flight line, uh, and then reduction in inventory. So we're gonna talk about all of those here today. Uh, let's not forget though, that there are certain technical challenges as well, especially in the area of qualification certification. All right, um, so this is more of the classic diagram uh, going back to Hopkins Dickens paper in, 20, in uh, 2003, but comparing, let's take a lever here. We wanna be able to compare two different manufacturing methods, conventional injection molding and laser centering. Now, if I am way off to the right in terms of my quantities, then the low cost approach to make these parts is injection molding. But if I need less than where that arrow is, less than the break even point, then in that case, additive manufacturing makes more sense. We kind of know this. We kind of know about this cost advantage that's associated with it. With the injection molding process, we need to invest in tooling and you have to amortize that tooling across the parts. So if you only have 10 parts or 100 parts, if you don't know how many parts you need because you don't know where that airplane's gonna be retired next year or 20 years from now, well, you know, this is where added manufacturing comes into play, but this isn't something that's fixed. Uh, it does depend on things. So I wanna talk about quantity and complexity here. So what we're talking about is geometric complexity, right? Not every part has the same geometric complexity. A cube is obviously very simple. A cylinder is simple. Most real parts can be more complex, very much more complex. And when we're talking about castings, castings can be, that's one of the reasons why we do castings, is to have highly complex uh, geometries. Um, so what we did is we looked at a model in the literature for uh, a quantifying complexity of castings, and we're looking at creating molds and cores associated with sand, sand casting using conventional means, which are the dotted lines, and uh, uh, additive manufacturing, which is a solid line there. What we're showing with the dots are break-even points. So we're comparing the cost of, set of a set of molds and cores versus complexity, geometric complexity. The break-even level, when it comes to complexity, decreases as the quantity decreases. Um, in other words, the fewer parts that you need, the less complex they have to be for additive manufacturing to be cost-effective. Alternatively, at high complexities, very high complexities, it really doesn't matter the quantity of parts, whether it's 10, 100, 1,000 or more, additive manufacturing is gonna be the only cost-effective way to produce those parts. And in this case here, we're talking about cores and we have the opportunity to do core consolidation and eliminate core breakage, reduce flash and so forth. So there's a variety of economic benefits that exist when we get to higher levels of use of uh, higher complexity levels. Um, one other note I want to make on that is that we recently published something in solid freeform fabrication proceedings from the summer on a, a more generalized approach to quantifying complexity. Um, and uh, that could be used not just for castings, but uh, casting type parts, but for any type of additively produced part, including lattices. So um, now let's talk about spare parts inventory. Uh, virtual inventory is a means that additive manufacturing is appealing because instead of having rows and rows of spare parts that you need, where you could end up with inventory obsolescence, uh, or, and you're balancing that versus stock out risk over many years of a system operating, um, we can reduce the lead time, we can reduce the co holding costs associated with warehousing using uh, additive manufacturing. Um, 
Generally, additive manufacturing reduces the stock out risk of spare parts. However, uh, let's, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but we do have conflicting incentives there. Okay? So basically what I'm talking about is this analysis that we did a few years back where we basically took an inventory and we used what's called an S1, S minus 1 S control policy, which is basically a, a part leaves the inventory and therefore we order a part to put back into the inventory. Okay? And in general, when you reduce the lead time it takes to get the part back from the, to get the part produced, which we can do with added manufacturing, in general, that reduces the risk of running out of parts. However, if you're trying to balance reducing the number of parts in inventory, uh, reducing your holding costs, or reducing just the sheer number of parts and places that you have to store parts, you can get these in, kind of this perverse incentive that could lead to increasing the risk of running out of parts. Now, in some cases, if you can withstand waiting a few days to get your part or even a week or so, that's fine. But there's a lot of applications where you need a critical off-the-shelf part where now you can reduce the inventory of those parts, but you have to be careful not to reduce it too much and then end up with a, a stock out. Okay. So positive implications, but it's a little more complex than what we generally think off the cuff. Right. So what does that mean for commercial aerospace uh, MRO? Well, you know, an airplane that can't fly is dollars, it's revenue that is uh, the company is losing. So if you could take 15% of all aerospace replacement parts and use additive manufacturing to produce those, you can save a billion dollars in material and transportation cost. If you could take those parts and turn them to 50%, then that becomes $3 billion. And then the commercial airline industry would also benefit from between 50 and 250 million in liquidity gained as a result of reduced inventory costs. And that analysis only looked at 3D printing spare parts and did not include tooling or, uh, or other or maintenance aids or part repair as well. Okay. So clear financial benefits for commercial aerospace MRL. Now, if we go in the world of defense and so forth, it's, it's not just the financial benefits, but also you're interested in lead time as well. So let's talk about some examples here. And so this is an example what we would call maintenance aid. This is 3D printing. In this case, the black part is a 3D printed part from a desktop printer, a Lulzbot. And basically, this is where you print a prototype of something that you're going to machine. It has to match fit the aircraft. But what we would do traditionally is we machine it then take it to the aircraft and then find out that we can't do the match fit. Um, so in this case here, what we can do is that we can print the basic shape, go out to the aircraft. We can even do match fit drilling right onto that part, then take it back before we do the CNC machining. Okay. So that saves machining time. CNC machining in an aerospace environment, it's a, it's a precious asset, uh, especially at operational level, but even at depot level. So and another advantage is the 3d printer can be unattended while the CNC machine is, is staffed, okay? So uh, both of those were identified as uh, benefits uh, from this approach. So even the sense of rapid prototyping for fit, fit checks, um, that's, a, that's a positive for aerospace maintenance and sustainment. Uh, this, was a, this is a highly publicized part, but this is the first Navy flight critical part to fly on an aircraft produced by additive manufacturing, first flight critical metal additive manufacturing part. So this is titanium uh, part, and it was a Lincoln fitting assembly. And what they did in order to lower the risk is that they picked a part where there was basically four attachment points uh, associated for, the, for, a flight, for this part, and they could basically fly with three of them uh, functioning. So they took one and made it added to manufacture, so that way it reduced the risk from an airworthiness standpoint. But, um, and, it's, and they put it on the aircraft, they did a test flight, and then they left it on the aircraft for continued observation uh, moving forward. Um, and I put a quote there from the Navy Public Affairs Office here, but basically saying they're looking at basically on-demand global spare parts for the fleet maintainers and operators, and as well as the OEMs, uh, storing data versus ordering, stocking, and shipping parts. So the Navy's speaking exactly what we talked about earlier with the advantages of spare part inventories. Now, uh, I wanted to show you this image here. This is a Marine on the uh, USS Wasp. The aircraft behind him is an F-35B, and he's holding in his hand a bumper. So I had to show you the, the, this image, the large image, because it's kind of hard to see the part. But that's a plastic bumper on a landing gear door for the F-35B, and apparently it would only break after a few flights on the aircraft. The only way that they could order a replacement part through the Department of Defense supply chain was to order an entire 
landing gear door, $70,000, and it would have to be flown out to the ship. So the Marine was in the chow line, uh, which is a great place to talk, and talk to a fellow Marine who's not in aviation maintenance, but was actually an electronics technician. That Marine had an Ultimaker 3D printer on the ship, and they got together and thought about, well, couldn't they just reverse engineer this part, draw up a new one, and 3D print it? They did. They worked with the Marine Corps Additive Manufacturing Team and Naval Air Systems Command, NAVAIR, approved it for flight worthiness, and now they were able to do these very low-cost, on-demand, 3D printed parts to keep aircraft flying without having to waste tens of thousands, probably millions of dollars in the long term. Um, so, you know, again, that's, that's just desktop printing there, but providing a flight, flight, uh, uh, flight worthy solution for an aircraft. Now I want to talk, the remainder of time I'll talk about the maturation of advanced manufacturing for low cost sustainment program or mammals program. Um, I'm going to play a video here, hopefully, if everything works. All right. The average age of uh, aircraft in the Air Force inventory is 27 years. That means we have to make or procure a lot of spare parts to keep all these planes flying. I think for, for our airmen, it's, it's really exciting to be able to, to turn a need and, and to have a some sort of solution turn around and be holding part much faster than they ever imagined and, and oftentimes at lower cost. <laughs> So the mammals program it originated in the fact that there's uh, statement settings, a lot of parts that we have trouble sourcing, a lot of uh, parts that need replacing navigation fleet. Suppliers may or may not be there anymore. So we're really trying to deliver some solutions and some uh, knowledge base for those personnel to be able to either make those parts themselves or be able to source it from a training supply chain, get those parts quickly and affordably where they're really challenging you that right the first phase was really to get to know all the operational needs. We were sending people to the logistics centers to try and understand where all the sustained needs were and what were the highest priorities. So within the phase one, we had a lot of teams, a lot of projects, about 26, 27, 28 different technology projects, and they're still ongoing. From there, the second year of honey came in, and we said we really need to attack near warriors statues, and we need to do it for families of parts. So we started down the efforts for bell cranes, oil coolers, bearings, and expanded these teams. So uh, phase three is in two parts. One of it is rapid transition. The project's already being worked in phase one. So we can cover a myriad of technologies. We have scanning uh, using the Creaform HandScan 700. We use fuse deposition modeling on many different machines. Powder bed fusion, direct metal laser sintering. Uh, laser engineered uh, systems lens processes. We have a lot of technologies underneath this program. It's really enabled us to uh, meet the need, specific needs of the partners that we work with. We've had the uh, you know, C-130s here at Yars, which has been an excellent platform for us to learn about their needs. Uh, but we've also had F-16 opportunities at Hill Air Force Base doing repair operations work on their tails. And other parts, uh, we had um, components at uh, Robbins Air Force Base for the C-5 to do demonstrate uh, rapid tooling uh, for them. But many parts, many systems, and it's just fun to watch. You know, these system program offices where this is absolutely new. They don't know how to qualify and certify these parts. So you've got the research community trying to help with lots of data and developing the procedures, but you've also got the operational level doing the training teaming with them so that hopefully as an entire community we can move the whole technology and get the sustainable world operational as far as having manufacturing goes. We're able to sustain our system more, more cheaply uh, with the high quality parts that, that saves us from having to go to other priorities or, or to increase our capabilities in other areas of our defense. So it's not broad based but very real. There is a lot of excitement about it. It's fearful excitement because we really don't know what that means. I'm hoping that in the next year, that if we can start to qualify a part on the 130, that we can do that once we print it and say, here, put this in, that that will actually start to change hearts and minds. It's enabling our fighters to stay on uh, mission. They've got the equipment that they need to protect us and protect themselves while they're doing it. 
that's really hard to quantify, but it means soldiers are coming home and greater ability to, to attack the world outside of the borders as well. All right, so um, so this is America Makes Project in partnership with AFRL. And anytime you're doing this sort of technical activity where you're going from lab to fly line, it becomes a large team with, with uh, multiple companies and uh, organizations that are involved with it, um, both on the civilian side as well as on the military side as well. So quite a bit of diversity that exists, uh, um, that exists in this particular type of project. And as uh, uh, Marvin mentioned here, um, it's a three multi-phase project. Phase one is basically low-hanging fruit, largely tooling-driven. Uh, phase two is much more qualification approach. One of the projects that YSU is involved in is a bell crank uh, type part for uh, aircraft and going through qualification-related research to support, support that. So airworthiness authorities have more confidence in what they're doing. Phase three is, is transitioning some of these things directly to the air logistics complexes and to the operational units. But there's also New research that tends to be more uh, uh, more emerging technologies focused or effects of defects type of uh, projects, um, and why she's involved in effective defects project as well as a uh, qualification uh, uh, feature based qualification for directed energy deposition project led by uh, that one's led by GE. So, um, some success stories, uh, some of which is bringing added manufacturing of flight lines. I kind of already talked about this with the part that I said earlier that was a uh, drill guide, but even again, just using hand uh, scanning that can be taken out to the aircraft, as well as uh, even just desktop printing for flight, flight line maintenance aids. Um, creating an agile casting supply chain, that 1,000 day lead time, trying to reduce that to a couple weeks, and working with the Air Force to set up their own microfoundry in the process. Um, showing some results where we took a uh, part that involved multiple castings welded together and eliminate the weldings using uh, consolidation facilitated by 3D sand printing, reducing lead times, reducing cost, and actually allowing for customized castings for, fit, for fitments on uh, aircraft. Tooling repair, um, so air, depots uh, that perform MRO operations uh, need tooling. And uh, they use a variety of tooling, and some of it gets worn out. We're able to show that you can use uh, uh, 3D scanning and uh, uh, FDM processes to be able to help rebuild those tools and put them back into action. And this was led by University of Dayton Research Institute. And then uh, more, more efforts on tooling repair. And then this, of course, is a printed duct that we saw earlier. So this is actually something that goes onto the aircraft. Um, this is an uh, airworthy part. Uh, using uh, Ultima 9085, and this was working with Boeing here to put this part on the aircraft. And again, things you have to think about is, it's great to print this in polymer, but you have to think about fire, smoke, and toxicity for anything that goes inside the aircraft. Right? So, all right, so to summarize, for spare parts, additive manufacturing gives us on-demand printing at the point of need and at reduced inventory, with reduced inventories. Added manufacturing can help maintenance, repair, and overall through maintenance aids, tooling, repair. We didn't really talk about repair here, but we did have a mammals project on it showing 40% reduction in lead time, 40% reduction in cost using directed energy deposition repair. Um, and then there's direct part production, of course. Added manufacturing strongest uh, value is for replacement parts where we have low quantities uh, required on an annual basis or uncertain demand. Um, high degree of complexity, um, and, and I think in the future we got to look towards customization as well. Um, and then, of course, adoption is a significant challenge. Training people to use advanced manufacturing, uh, organizations, you know, large organizations, whether you're FedEx, UPS, or the Air Force, uh, or the Department of Defense, need to look at how they're going to reorganize the way that they do business uh, in order to adopt additive manufacturing. And anytime we're dealing with critical systems like aircraft, qualification certification becomes uh, important, all right? And MAMMALS is one of those programs designed to address some of those challenges. So, no, we're coming to our close here, so I wanted to give you my contact information here. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. Check out our website. 
Um, it, you know, even uh, we've got plenty of equipment and uh, that you can leverage, uh, and even some that aren't even on the uh, on the list yet because they just got here. But uh, uh, we're always looking for the opportunity to collaborate with people in uh, additive manufacturing area, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. So thank you.